The Lost Symbol Novel by Dan Brown Chapter 41 Robert Langdon studied the stone pyramid. This isn't possible. An ancient encoded language, Sato said without looking up. Tell me, does this qualify? On the newly exposed face of the pyramid, a series of 16 characters was precisely engraved into the smooth stone. Beside Langdon, Anderson's mouth now gaped open, mirroring Langdon's own shock. The security chief looked like he had just seen some kind of alien keypad. Professor, Sato said, I assume you can read this. Langdon turned. Why would you assume that? Because you were brought here, Professor. You were chosen. This inscription appears to be a code of some sort, and considering your reputation, it seems obvious to me that you were brought here to decipher it. Langdon had to admit that after his experiences in Rome and Paris, he'd received a steady flow of requests asking for his help deciphering some of history's great unsolved codes the Phaestos disc, the Dorabella cipher, the mysterious Voynich manuscript. Sato ran her finger over the inscription. Can you tell me the meaning of these icons? They're not icons, Langdon thought. They're symbols. The language was one he had recognized immediately, an encrypted cipher language from the 17th century. Langdon knew very well how to break it. Ma'am, he said, feeling hesitant, this pyramid is Peter's private property. Private or not, if this code is indeed the reason you were brought to Washington, I am not giving you a choice in the matter. I want to know what it says. Sato's blackberry pinged loudly, and she yanked the device from her pocket, studying the incoming message for several moments. Langdon was amazed that the Capitol building's internal wireless network provided service this far down. Sato grunted and raised her eyebrows, giving Langdon an odd look. Chief Anderson, she said, turning to him. A word in private, if I may. The director motioned for Anderson to join her, and they disappeared into the pitch-black hallway, leaving Langdon alone in the flickering candlelight of Peter's chamber of reflection. Chief Anderson wondered when this night would end. A severed hand in my rotunda? A death shrine in my basement? Bizarre engravings on a stone pyramid? Somehow, the Redskins game no longer felt significant. As he followed Sato into the darkness of the hall, Anderson flicked on his flashlight. The beam was weak but better than nothing. Sato led him down the hall a few yards, out of sight of Langdon. Have a look at this, she whispered, handing Anderson her blackberry. Anderson took the device and squinted at the illuminated screen. It displayed a black and white image the X-ray of Langdon's bag that Anderson had requested be sent to Sato. As in all X-rays, the objects of greatest density appeared in the brightest white. In Langdon's bag, a lone item outshone everything else. Obviously extremely dense, the object glowed like a dazzling jewel in a murky jumble of other items. Its shape was unmistakable. He's been carrying that all night? Anderson looked over at Sato in surprise. Why didn't Langdon mention this? Damn it, good question, Sato whispered. The shape. It can't be coincidence. No, Sato said, her tone angry now. I would say not. A faint rustle in the corridor drew Anderson's attention. Startled, he pointed his flashlight down the black passageway. The dying beam revealed only a deserted corridor, lined with open doors. Hello? Anderson said. Is somebody there? Silence. Sato gave him an odd look, apparently having heard nothing. Anderson listened a moment longer and then shook it off. I've got to get out of here. Alone in the candlelit chamber, Langdon ran his fingers over the sharply carved edges of the pyramid's engraving. He was curious to know what the message said, 
and yet he was not about to intrude on Peter Solomon's privacy any more than they already had. And why would this lunatic care about this small pyramid anyway? We have a problem, Professor, Sato's voice declared loudly behind him. I've just received a new piece of information, and I've had enough of your lies. Langdon turned to see the OS director marching in, Blackberry in hand and fire in her eyes. Taken aback, Langdon looked to Anderson for help, but the chief was now standing guard at the door, his expression unsympathetic. Sato arrived in front of Langdon and thrust her Blackberry in his face. Bewildered, Langdon looked at the screen, which displayed an inverted black and white photograph, like a ghostly film negative. The photo looked like a jumble of objects, and one of them shone very brightly. Though askew and off-center, the brightest object was clearly a little, pointed pyramid. A tiny pyramid? Langdon looked at Sato. What is this? The question seemed only to incense Sato further. You're pretending you don't know. Langdon's temper flared. I'm not pretending anything. I've never seen this before in my life. Bullshit. Sato snapped, her voice cutting through the musty air. You've been carrying it in your bag all night. I, Langdon stalled mid-sentence. His eyes moved slowly down to the daybag on his shoulder. Then he raised them again to the blackberry. My God! The package! He looked more closely at the image. Now he saw it. A ghostly cube, enclosing the pyramid. Stunned, Langdon realized he was looking at an X-ray of his bag. And also of Peter's mysterious cube-shaped package. The cube was, in fact, a hollow box. A small pyramid. Langdon opened his mouth to speak, but his words failed him. He felt the breath go out of his lungs as a new revelation struck him. Simple. Pure. Devastating. My God. He looked back at the truncated stone pyramid on the desk. Its apex was flat a small square area a blank space symbolically awaiting its final piece. That piece which would transform it from an unfinished pyramid into a true pyramid. Langdon now realized the tiny pyramid he was carrying was not a pyramid at all. It's a capstone. At that instant, he knew why he alone could unlock the mysteries of this pyramid. I hold the final piece. And it is indeed a talisman. When Peter had told Langdon the package contained a talisman, Langdon had laughed. Now he realized his friend was right. This tiny capstone was a talisman, but not the magic kind. The far older kind. Long before talisman had magical connotations, it had another meaning, completion. From the Greek telisma, meaning, complete, a talisman was any object or idea that completed another and made it whole. The finishing element. A capstone, symbolically speaking, was the ultimate talisman, transforming the unfinished pyramid into a symbol of completed perfection. Langdon now felt an airy convergence that forced him to accept one very strange truth. With the exception of its size, the stone pyramid in Peter's chamber of reflection seemed to be transforming itself, bit by bit, into something vaguely resembling the masonic pyramid of legend. From the brightness with which the capstone shone on the X-ray, Langdon suspected it was made of metal. A very dense metal. Whether or not it was solid gold, he had no way of knowing, and he was not about to let his mind start playing tricks on him. This pyramid is too small. The code's too easy to read. And it's a myth, for heaven's sake. Sato was watching him. For a bright man, Professor, you've made some dumb choices tonight. Lying to an intelligence director? Intentionally obstructing a CIA investigation? I can explain, if you let me. 
you will be explaining at CIA headquarters. As of this moment, I am detaining you. Langdon's body went rigid. You can't possibly be serious. Deadly serious. I made it very clear to you that the stakes tonight were high and you chose not to cooperate. I strongly suggest you start thinking about explaining the inscription on this pyramid because when we arrive at the CIA. She raised her blackberry and took a close-up snapshot of the engraving on the stone pyramid. My analysts will have had a head start. Langdon opened his mouth to protest. But Sato was already turning to Anderson at the door. Chief, she said, put the stone pyramid in Langdon's bag and carry it. I'll handle taking Mr. Langdon into custody. Your weapon, if I may. Anderson was stone-faced as he advanced into the chamber, unsnapping his shoulder holster as he came. He gave his gun to Sato, who immediately aimed it at Langdon. Langdon watched as if in a dream. This cannot be happening. Anderson now came to Langdon and removed the daybag from his shoulder, carrying it over to the desk and setting it on the chair. He unzipped the bag, propped it open, and then hoisted the heavy stone pyramid off the desk and into the bag, along with Langdon's notes and the tiny package. Suddenly there was a rustle of movement in the hallway. A dark outline of a man materialized in the doorway, rushing into the chamber and approaching fast behind Anderson. The chief never saw him coming. In an instant, the stranger had lowered his shoulder and crashed into Anderson's back. The chief launched forward, his head cracking into the edge of the stone niche. He fell hard, crumpling on the desk, sending bones and artifacts flying. The hourglass shattered on the floor. The candle toppled to the floor, still burning. Sato reeled amid the chaos, raising the gun, but the intruder grabbed a femur and lashed out with it, striking her shoulder with the leg bone. Sato let out a cry of pain and fell back, dropping the weapon. The newcomer kicked the gun away and then wheeled toward Langdon. The man was tall and slender, an elegant African-American whom Langdon had never seen before in his life. Grab the pyramid, the man commanded. Follow me. Chapter 42 The African-American man leading Langdon through the capital's subterranean maze was clearly someone of power. Beyond knowing his way through all the side corridors and back rooms, the elegant stranger carried a key ring that seemed to unlock every door that blocked their way. Langdon followed, quickly running up an unfamiliar staircase. As they climbed, he felt the leather strap of his dayback cutting hard into his shoulder. The stone pyramid was so heavy that Langdon feared the bag's strap might break. The past few minutes defeat all logic, and now Langdon found himself moving on instinct alone. His gut told him to trust this stranger. Beyond saving Langdon from Sato's arrest, the man had taken dangerous action to protect Peter Solomon's mysterious pyramid. Whatever the pyramid may be. While his motivation remained a mystery, Langdon had glimpsed a telltale shimmer of gold on the man's hand a masonic ring the double-headed phoenix and the number 33. This man and Peter Solomon were more than trusted friends. They were Masonic brothers of the highest degree. Langdon followed him to the top of the stairs, into another corridor, and then through an unmarked door into a utilitarian hallway. They ran past supply boxes and bags of garbage, veering off suddenly through a service door that deposited them in an utterly unexpected world a plush movie theatre of some sort. The older man led the way up the side aisle and out the main doors into the light of a large atrium. Langdon now realized they were in the visitor center through which he had entered earlier tonight. Unfortunately, so was a Capitol police officer. As they came face to face with the officer, all three men stopped, staring at one another. Langdon recognized the young Hispanic officer from the X-ray machine earlier tonight. Officer Nunez, the African-American man said. 
Not a word. Follow me. The guard looked uneasy but obeyed without question. Who is this guy? The three of them hurried toward the southeast corner of the visitor center, where they arrived at a small foyer and a set of heavy doors blocked with orange pylons. The doors were sealed with masking tape, apparently to keep the dust of whatever was happening beyond out of the visitor center. The man reached up and peeled off the tape on the door. Then he flipped through his key ring as he spoke to the guard. Our friend Chief Anderson is in the sub-basement. He may be injured. You'll want to check on him. Yes, sir. Nunez looked as baffled as he did alarmed. Most important, you did not see us. The man found a key, took it off the key ring, and used it to turn the heavy dead bolt. He pulled open the steel door and tossed the key to the guard. Lock this door behind us. Put the tape back on as best as you can. Pocket the key and say nothing. To anyone. Including the chief. Is that clear, Officer Nunez? The guard eyed the key as if he'd just been interested with a precious gem. It is, sir. The man hurried through the door and Langdon followed. The guard locked the heavy bolt behind them and Langdon could hear him reapplying the masking tape. Professor Langdon, the man said as they strode briskly down a modern-looking corridor that was obviously under construction. My name is Warren Bellamy. Peter Salomon is a dear friend of mine. Langdon shot a startled glance at the stately man. You're Warren Bellamy? Langdon had never met the architect of the Capitol, but he certainly knew the man's name. Peter speaks very highly of you, Bellamy said, and I'm sorry we are meeting under these dreadful circumstances. Peter is in terrible trouble. His hand. I know. Bellamy sounded grim. That's not the half of it, I'm afraid. They reached the end of the lit section of corridor and the passageway took an abrupt left. The remaining length of corridor, wherever it went, was pitch black. Hold on, Bellamy said, disappearing into a nearby electrical room from which a tangle of heavy-duty orange extension cords snaked out, running away from them into the darkness of the corridor. Langdon waited while Bellamy rooted around inside. The architect must have located the switch that sent power to the extension cords, because suddenly the route before them became illuminated. Langdon could only stare. Washington, D.C. like Rome was a city laced with secret passageways and underground tunnels. The passage before them now reminded Langdon of the Passito Tunnel connecting the Vatican to Castel Sant'Angelo. Long. Dark. Narrow. Unlike the ancient Passito, however, this passage was modern and not yet complete. It was a slender construction zone that was so long it seemed to narrow to nothing at its distant end. The only lighting was a string of intermittent construction bulbs that did little more than accentuate the tunnel's impossible length. Bellamy was already heading down the passage. Follow me. Watch your step. Langdon felt himself fall into step behind Bellamy, wondering where on earth this tunnel led. At that moment, Malak stepped out of pod 3 and strode briskly down the deserted main corridor of the SMSC toward pod 5. He clutched Trish's keycard in his hand and quietly whispered, 0804. Something else was cycling through his mind as well. Malak had just received an urgent message from the Capitol building. My contact has run into unforeseen difficulties. Even so, the news remained encouraging. Robert Langdon now possessed both the pyramid and the capstone. Despite the unexpected way in which it had happened, the crucial pieces were falling into place. It was almost as if destiny itself were guiding tonight's events, ensuring Malaka's victory. Chapter 43 Langdon hurried to keep pace with Warren Bellamy's brisk footsteps as they moved without a word down the long tunnel. So far, 
the architect of the capitol appeared far more intent on putting distance between sato and this stone pyramid than he did on explaining to langdon what was going on Langdon had a growing apprehension that there was far more going on than he could imagine. The CIA, the architect of the Capitol, two thirty-third degree masons. The shrill sound of Langdon's cell phone cut the air. He pulled his phone from his jacket. Uncertain, he answered, "Hello." The voice that spoke was an airy, familiar whisper, "Professor." I hear you had unexpected company. Langdon felt an icy chill. Where the hell is Peter? He demanded, his words reverberating in the enclosed tunnel. Beside him, Warren Bellamy glanced over, looking concerned and motioning for Langdon to keep walking. Don't worry, the voice said. As I told you, Peter is somewhere safe. You cut off his hand, for God's sake. He needs a doctor. He needs a priest. The man replied. But you can save him. If you do as I command, Peter will live. I give you my word. The word of a madman means nothing to me. Madman, professor, surely you appreciate the reverence with which I have adhered to the ancient protocols tonight. The hand of the mysteries guided you to a portal the pyramid that promises to unveil ancient wisdom. I know you now possess it. You think this is the masonic pyramid? Langdon demanded. It's a chunk of rock. There was silence on the other end of the line. Mr Langdon, you're too smart to play dumb. You know very well what you've uncovered tonight. A stone pyramid. Hidden at the core of Washington, D.C., by a powerful mason. You are chasing a myth. Whatever Peter told you, he told you in fear. The legend of the Masonic pyramid is fiction. The Masons never built any pyramid to protect secret wisdom. And even if they did, this pyramid is far too small to be what you think it is. The man chuckled. I see Peter has told you very little. Nonetheless, Mr Langdon, whether or not you choose to accept what it is you now poses, you will do as I say. I am well aware that the pyramid you are carrying has an encrypted engraving. You will decipher that engraving for me. Then, and only then, will I return Peter Solomon to you. Whatever you believe this engraving reveals, Langdon said, it won't be the ancient mysteries of course not he replied the mysteries are far too vast to be written on the side of a little stone pyramid the response got langdon off guard but if this engraving is not the ancient mysteries then this pyramid is not the masonic pyramid legend clearly states the masonic pyramid was constructed to protect the ancient mysteries The man's tone was condescending now. Mr Langdon, the Masonic pyramid was constructed to preserve the ancient mysteries, but with a twist you've apparently not yet grasped. Did Peter never tell you? The power of the Masonic pyramid is not that it reveals the mysteries themselves, but rather that it reveals the secret location where the mysteries are buried. Langdon did a double take. Decipher the engraving. the voice continued and it will tell you the hiding place of mankind's greatest treasure he laughed peter did not entrust you with the treasure itself professor langdon came to an abrupt halt in the tunnel hold on you're saying this pyramid is a map bellamy jolted to a stop now too his expression one of shock and alarm clearly The caller had just hit a raw nerve. The pyramid is a map. This map, the voice whispered, or pyramid, or portal, or whatever you choose to call it, was created long ago to ensure the hiding place of the ancient mysteries would never be forgotten. That it would never be lost to history. A grid of 16 symbols doesn't look much like a map. Appearances can be deceiving, professor. But regardless, 
you alone have the power to read that inscription. You're wrong, Langdon fired back, picturing the simplistic cipher. Anyone could decipher this engraving. It's not very sophisticated. I suspect there is more to the pyramid than meets the eye. Regardless, you alone poses the capstone. Langdon pictured the little capstone in his bag. Order from chaos? He didn't know what to believe anymore, but the stone pyramid in his bag seemed to be getting heavier with every passing moment. Malak pressed the cell phone to his ear, enjoying the sound of Langdon's anxious breathing on the other end. Right now, I have business to attend to, Professor, and so do you. Call me as soon as you have deciphered the map. We will go together to the hiding place and make our trade. Peter's life. For all the wisdom of the ages. I will do nothing, Langdon declared. Especially not without proof Peter is alive. I suggest you not test me. You are a very small cog in a vast machine. If you disobey me or attempt to find me, Peter will die. This I swear. For all I know, Peter is already dead. He is very much alive, Professor, but he desperately needs your help. What are you really looking for? Langdon shouted into the phone. Malak paused before answering. Many people have pursued the ancient mysteries and debated their power. Tonight, I will prove the mysteries are real. Langdon was silent. I suggest you get to work on the map immediately, Malak said. I need this information today. Today. It's already after nine o'clock. Exactly. Tempest Fugit. Chapter 44 New York editor Jonas Falkman was just turning off the lights in his Manhattan office when his phone rang. He had no intention of picking up at this hour that is, until he glimpsed the caller ID display. This ought to be good, he thought, reaching for the receiver. Do we still publish you? Falkman asked, half serious. Jonas. Robert Langdon's voice sounded anxious. Thank God you're there. I need your help. Falkman's spirits lifted. You've got pages for me to edit, Robert. Finally? No, I need information. Last year, I connected you with a scientist named Catherine Salomon, the sister of Peter Salomon. Falkman frowned. No pages. She was looking for a publisher for a book on noetic science. Do you remember her? Falkman rolled his eyes. Sure. I remember. And thanks a million for that introduction. Not only did she refuse to let me read the results of her research, she didn't want to publish anything until some magical date in the future. Jonas, listen to me, I don't have time. I need Catherine's phone number. Right now. Do you have it? I've got to warn you. You're acting a little desperate. She's great looking, but you're not going to impress her by, this is no joke, Jonas, I need her number now. All right. Hold on. Falkman and Langdon had been close friends for enough years that Falkman knew when Langdon was serious. Jonas typed the name Catherine Salomon into a search window and began scanning the company's email server. I'm looking now, Falkman said. And for what it's worth, when you call her, you may not want to call from the Harvard pool. It sounds like you're in an asylum. I'm not at the pool. I'm in a tunnel under the US Capitol. Falkman sensed from Langdon's voice that he was not joking. What is it with this guy? Robert, why can't you just stay home and write? His computer pinged. Okay, hold on. I got it. He moused through the old email thread. It looks like all I have is her cell. I'll take it. Falkman gave him the number. Thanks, Jonas, Langdon said, 
sounding grateful. I owe you one. You owe me a manuscript, Robert. Do you have any idea how long the line went dead? Falkman stared at the receiver and shook his head. Book publishing would be so much easier without the authors. Chapter 45 Catherine Salomon did a double take when she saw the name on her caller ID. She had imagined the incoming call was from Trish, checking in to explain why she and Christopher Abaddon were taking so long. But the caller was not Trish. Far from it. Catherine felt a blushing smile cross her lips. Could tonight get any stranger? She flipped open her phone. Don't tell me, she said playfully. Bookish bachelor seeking single noetic scientist. Catherine. The deep voice belonged to Robert Langdon. Thank God you're okay. Of course I'm okay. She replied, puzzled. Other than the fact that you never called me after that party at Peter's house last summer. Something has happened tonight. Please listen. His normally smooth voice sounded ragged. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. But Peter is in serious trouble. Catherine's smile disappeared. What are you talking about? Peter. Langdon hesitated as if searching for words. I don't know how to say it, but he's been taken. I'm not sure how or by whom, but taken. Catherine demanded. Robert, you're scaring me. Taken. Where? Taken captive. Langdon's voice cracked as if he were overwhelmed. It must have happened earlier today or maybe yesterday. This isn't funny, she said angrily. My brother is fine. I just spoke to him 15 minutes ago. You did? Langdon sounded stunned. Yes. He just texted me to say he was coming to the lab. He texted you. Langdon thought out loud. But you didn't actually hear his voice. No, but listen to me. The text you received was not from your brother. Someone has Peter's phone. He's dangerous. Whoever it is tricked me into coming to Washington tonight. Tricked you? You're not making any sense. I know, I'm so sorry. Langdon seemed uncharacteristically disoriented. Catherine, I think you could be in danger. Catherine Salomon was sure that Langdon would never joke about something like this, and yet he sounded like he had lost his mind. I'm fine, she said. I'm locked inside a secure building. Read me the message you got from Peter's phone. Please. Bewildered, Catherine pulled up the text message and read it to Langdon, feeling a chill as she came to the final part referencing Dr. Abaddon. If available, have Dr. Abaddon join us inside. I trust him fully. Oh God! Langdon's voice was laced with fear. Did you invite this man inside? Yes. My assistant just went out to the lobby to get him. I expect them back any. Catherine, get out! Langdon yelled. Now! At the other side of the SMSC, Inside the security room, a phone began ringing, drowning out the Redskins game. The guard reluctantly pulled out his earbuds one more time. Lobby, he answered. This is Kyle. Kyle, it's Catherine Salomon. Her voice sounded anxious, out of breath. Ma'am, your brother has not yet. Where's Trish? she demanded. Can you see her on the monitors? The guard rolled his chair over to look at the screens. She hasn't gotten back to the cube yet. No. Catherine shouted, sounding alarmed. The guard now realized that Catherine Salomon was out of breath, as if she were running. What's going on back there? The guard quickly worked the video joystick, skimming through frames of digital video at rapid speed. Okay, 
Hold on, scrolling through playback. I've got Trish with your guest leaving the lobby. They move down the street. Fast forwarding. Okay, they're going into wet pod. Trish uses her keycard to unlock the door. Both of them step into wet pod. Fast forwarding. Okay, here they are coming out of wet pod just a minute ago. Heading down. He cocked his head, slowing the playback. Wait a minute. That's odd. What? The gentleman came out of wet pod alone. Trish stayed inside. Yes, it looks that way. I'm watching your guest now. He's in the hall on his own. Where is Trish? Catherine asked more frantically. I don't see her on the video feed, he replied, an edge of anxiety creeping into his voice. He looked back at the screen and noticed that the man's jacket sleeves appeared to be wet. All the way up to his elbows. What in the world did he do in wet pod? The guard watched as the man began to move purposefully down the main hallway toward pod 5, clutching in his hand what looked like a key card. The guard felt the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. Miss Solomon, we've got a serious problem. Tonight was a night of firsts for Catherine Solomon. In two years, she had never used her cell phone inside the void. Nor had she ever crossed the void at a dead run. At the moment, however, Catherine had a cell phone pressed to her ear while she was dashing blindly along the endless length of carpet. Each time she felt a foot stray from the carpet, she corrected back to center, racing on through the sheer darkness. Where is he now? Catherine asked the guard, breathless. Checking now, the guard replied. Fast forwarding. Okay, here he is walking down the hall. Moving toward pod 5. Catherine ran harder, hoping to reach the exit before she got trapped back here. How long until he gets to the pod 5 entrance? The guard paused. Ma'am, you don't understand. I'm still fast forwarding. This is recorded playback. This already happened. He paused. Hold on, let me check the entry event monitor. He paused and then said, Ma'am, Miss Dunn's key card shows a pod 5 entry event about a minute ago. Catherine slammed on the brakes, sliding to a halt in the middle of the abyss. He already unlocked pod 5, she whispered into the phone. The guard was typing frantically. Yes, it looks like he entered. 90 seconds ago. Catherine's body went rigid. She stopped breathing. The darkness felt suddenly alive all around her. He's in here with me. In an instant, Catherine realized that the only light in the entire space was coming from her cell phone, illuminating the side of her face. Send help, she whispered to the guard. And get to wet pot to help Trish. Then she quietly closed her phone, extinguishing the light. Absolute darkness settled around her. She stood stock still and breathed as quietly as possible. After a few seconds, the pungent scent of ethanol wafted out of the darkness in front of her. The smell got stronger. She could sense a presence, only a few feet in front of her on the carpet. In the silence, the pounding of Catherine's heart seemed loud enough to give her away. Silently, she stepped out of her shoes an inch to her left, sidestepping off the carpet. The cement felt cold under her feet. She took one more step to clear the carpet. One of her toes cracked. It sounded like a gunshot in the stillness. Only a few yards away, a rustle of clothing suddenly came at her out of the darkness. Catherine bolted an instant too late and a powerful arm snagged her, groping in the darkness, hands violently attempting to gain perches. She spun away as a vice leg grip caught her lab coat, yanking her backward, reeling her in. Catherine threw her arms backward, 
slithering out of her lab coat and slipping free. Suddenly, with no idea anymore which way was out, Catherine Salomon found herself dashing, dead blind, across an endless black abyss.